This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. I'm your host Duncan McLeish, welcome to the show. Up on this episode we are doing a first of a two-part series on Glasgow Fright Fest. This first part we'll be looking at the movies that played on the Friday, uh, the five movies in total and then the next part which we'll be dropping later next week. We'll be covering the Saturday, which had six movies. So yeah, these are all movies that played at Fright Place Glasgow 2024. Some of which have release dates already, or streaming dates, or theatre dates, or whatever. Uh, some of the movies don't have that at the moment when it comes to distribution, um, or ease of being able to check them out. So, as always, please use the chapters and exercise extreme caution as I tend to delve into spoiler territory willy-nilly. And, uh, yeah, I mean, use your best judgment if you want to know nothing about any of the movies mentioned here. Then jump ahead to the next chapter or jump right to the end or hit pause and revisit once you've checked out the movies. You are in control, ladies and gents. So, without any further ado... We are going to take a very short break and uh, when we return we are going to be discussing the first movie that played at Glasgow Fright Fest on the Friday for 2024. We'll be right back right after this. And welcome back. So the first movie was The Soul Eater. This is uh, the return of the directing duo behind Inside and Levide. Uh, and some other movies that they've made in the past, those two being the prominent one-two gut punch of the new wave of French extremity. Um, the Soul Eater uh, has some details as listed on IMDb where pictures will display while I talk about them. The Soul Eater is directed and written by Alice Batral and Luvicio Leffy Um The movie stars Virginia Leoden, Paul Hamsey, um, Cédrien Boyer, Francis Renaud, Malik Zadid, Cameron Bain, and some other folks. Synopsis for this one is listed on the IMDb's. Is when violent and gruesome deaths start plaguing a small mountain village, an old legend about a malevolent creature resurface. So yeah, um, this one was the opening movie. Heavy hitter as well in terms of the the director's known behind this one. Um, the guys behind Fright Fest have been pretty great at publicising these directors' works in the past and I'm a fan. It's hard to move away from that level of respect which comes from having seen Inside I think about the year it was released and just being absolutely destroyed by um, their take on home invasion and the, the level of detail and horror, specifically the violence and the practical effects that Serum did that release. I've been in awe since. Uh, Levid, which has, I think, struggled to get her. I think it is now available in America, but was available not long after its release in the UK. Has kind of struggled to capture um, an audience because of that lack of distribution in the States. And I'm not too sure why that was. I don't know if that's a case of uh, studios buying up the rights so they could release their remake in advance which was a practice that was kind of done in the early 2000s um, and through even though that movie is kind of later 2000s. Um, they've, they've done some movies since. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of everything they've done. Um, they did that kind of found footage horror underwater thing that was on Netflix a couple of years ago which name escapes me. But for me they're always going to be the guys who did French horror cinema right 
with that one-two punch of Inside and Levied. So this one is a return back to France, a much more slow burn, um, kind of mystery, sort of, I was going to say buddy cop, but it has none of the humour or wit of a buddy cop, and that's probably great because of the subject matter. Interestingly enough, when Alan Jones introduced this one, he was like that, I think, you know, Pascal Logier's The Tall Man, and that's kind of the element that you're dealing with in this one. Um, it plays out very much as a kind of gritty cop drama with horror elements. There are like supremely violent deaths in this small village, which seem to be linked around child abduction. And these two police officers kind of join forces, one from the, the point of view of missing children, the other one from the point of view of these violent deaths kind of have to join forces in this small kind of Twin Peaksian mountain town as the try and pick apart the mystery behind it. Meanwhile, you know, every open door uh, leads to another question as to the mystery that hides behind it. I thought it was it was well done. It was well acted. I, I like the symbolism, the actual idea or entity of the Soul Eater. is kind of cool in a similar way to like the Tall Man or the Empty Man, um, more recently of this kind of mythical folklorian creature which exists out there as a boogie story to kids but also maybe a small element of truth that lies behind it um, the police procedural stuff's done really really well I will say it it's pacing this one was one of the longer movies that played at Fright Fest it's a lot about the two hour mark just a little bit over um, I mean it allows you to breathe into it but I don't think there's a huge amount of character development which nurtures a time of that run length I think they could have probably chopped out about 15 minutes and they wouldn't have lost a huge amount. Although in saying that, it did hit its beats when it needed to and, and kind of pushed itself through those plot points of revealing more of the story as we got through it. As Fright Fest movies go, as kickoff movies go at Fright Fest, I don't think it's the one that necessarily got the crowd like, here we go, like fucking two days of cinema, living movies. It kind of felt like an odd choice, specifically when we talk about the next movie, which was also French language. Um, it's a bold choice to kick off with two foreign French movies as your opening movies on the day. I kind of felt like there was maybe from a, a constructional point of the festival of how things run together, I don't think that was necessarily well well done, if you know what I mean. Uh, but it was a good movie nonetheless. I, I don't think it's one that I would say rush out and check. But certainly during the run of it in the cinema, I was I was engaged in the story. Overall, I gave this one a three and a half out of five. Um, having revisited my notes from then, I'm sticking with that one. It's not a case of the festival goggles have tampered that. I think if I watched it again, I would probably land at the same score. So yeah, that was the Soul Eater. It was the first movie that opened Fright Fest on the Friday. I gave it a three and a half out of five. So uh, let's talk about the next one. The Deep Dark is the next movie. It's written and directed by uh, Matteo Turi. This one has a cast of Samuel Le Bier, Amir El Kakim, uh, Thomas Souviers, Jean Hughes Angelad, uh, Carl Leof, and some other folks are here as well. Synopsis for this one is Miners are forced to take a professor underground with them to take samples for his measurements. After a landslide prevents him from going back up, they discover a crypt from another time, unknowingly waking a bloodthirsty creature. So The Deep Dark was the second movie, uh, also French language, so that's what I'm saying, I think there was an interesting... In fact, the weirder thing is there is a line in this movie where someone refers to the entity in this one as a soul eater, which did make me kind of sit back and go, two French movies, both referencing soul eater, that's a bit bizarre. Uh, this one, shorter on pace, period piece, um, set kind of in the mines or dangerous mines uh, of kind of French run industrial complex. Uh, this one here is, it kind of starts with a scene from the past, like with old mining tactics, and then we move into the more industrialised version of these mining uh, kind of tactics um, and the professor with clearly an ulterior motive shows up and wants um, to be escorted down to a particular volatile area of 
of the the kind of underground mining system uh and there's a kind of ragtag group of miscreants and, and manly men who uh, make up this particularly i was going to say diverse but they're not really diverse um uh, Stalwart is probably the word I'm going to use. Stalwart group of miners um, who, you know, are going to get a big payday if they take them down there. When they get down there, obviously they unlock something they're not supposed to, unleash something they're not supposed to, and then this uh, entity comes for them one at a time whilst the miners are trying to work out essentially how to get out of the scenario that they were in get out of the mine in time and how they stop the creature from getting them. I think the acting's really strong in this one and I really liked the script. I thought the play between the characters was a lot of fun. I think in terms of set design, that was really good. I think in terms of creature design, this is where the movie kind of fell apart. It took a long time to get to the creature. I mean, this isn't a particularly long movie. It's about an hour and 45, I think. Um, and we, we are spending a long time before the creature starts to come for them. And when you see the creature, the movie the movie kind of falls apart a little bit. The creature design is not great. Its movements are not great. And it took me out of the movie. It was kind of goofy, goofily done is the way I would describe it. Uh, the creature itself has limited to no mobility, um, probably because of its design. And as a result, kind of, kept standing raising its arms with its legs very close together and I kind of I think we likened it in our viewing to kind of Buffalo Bill where he's wearing the skin suit and tucking his dick between his legs it kind of had that that feel um which is almost comedic and that's not what the movie's going for at all uh, this is one of these ones where on paper this sounded like it was going to be a great time like where you were going to have a lot of fun with it and by the end of it, I was kind of just like, what a huge missed opportunity. This could have been so much better if handled a little bit more with a little bit more money or a little bit less monster. Sometimes less is more. Um, I think it's not about... I know some people want to see the creature on screen, but this is what happens when you push that kind of ideology in the face of lacking budget. It's not a bad movie by any stretch of the imagination, but... It just kind of felt like a, like someone had taken a swing at a really kind of hard pitch ball and just clipped it but not quite connected with it. And as a result, it didn't go nearly as far or have nearly as much traction as it should have. Um, I, I would not tell anyone to rush out and check this movie. However, if it appeared on a Netflix or a Shudder or a Screenbox or something and you were at a loss or something to do, there are worse ways to spend an hour and 45 minutes of your time. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I landed in on this one. I gave it a 3 out of 5. I didn't hate it. I didn't think it was amazing. And yeah, that's uh, really all I have to say about that, to be honest with you. Um, interestingly enough, the next movie, The Invisible Raptor, which we're about to get to, was the one, if you check my preview of Fright Fest, uh, well, you will know I was like that. This movie looks awful. I'm going to hate this movie. Um... This one, you know, is likely not to land well with me. It looks absurd. And uh, boy, did I eat my words. Not all of them, but most of them. Yeah, we're going to be back to talk about The Invisible Raptor right after this. So up next was The Invisible Raptor. Let's give you the deets on this movie. The Invisible Raptor is directed by Mike Hermosa. It was written, co-written by Mike Capes and Johnny Wickham. Uh, the movie stars Sean Astin, that's right, um, but also has Mike Capes in the lead role. Uh, Sandy Martin, David Shackelford, Caitlin McHugh, Bobby Gilchrist, Larry Hankin, who you will know from Friends as the neighbour downstairs that's always complaining about the noise. Um, Richard Rayleigh and some other folks are in here as well. Synopsis is an amusement park paleontologist and a hapless security guard team up to stop an invisible raptor from wrecking havoc on their small town. So, yeah, I, I uh, shit on this one pretty hard um, in the preview and this turned out to be my second favourite movie of the entire um, festival. I think this is wickedly funny, like genuinely wickedly funny and they lean into it. Uh, Mike Capes and let me get this guy's name right, David Shackelford. 
who was in attendance at the the event are a comedy one two double punch duo which was kind of kind of incredible uh shackleford in particular is his comedic timing is unbelievably good uh, i was howling through most of this movie I mean, it wears its influences on its sleeve. It's a, a, a kind of ode to the kind of big Spielbergian 80s and 90s blockbusters. There's references to Jurassic Park all the way through this, but things like Jewel and Jaws as well. Um, but it's, it's not like low-hanging fruit for the film, considering that they openly said the reason we made it Invisible Raptor is because we didn't have the budget to make a real raptor. And you would think walking into that, that they would have kind of cut corners. It weirdly didn't feel like it at all. Actually, the concept, what the humour is based around it, the effects that they do use are really, really well done. There's tons of gore and practical effects. Um, and albeit maybe as a tad long, I'll be honest, there's a bit where I felt like, oh, the movie could end here and it would be great. The payoff to the elongated ending is actually kind of wonderful. So yeah, I spent my time fully expecting that... <laughs> I spent my time fully expecting to hate this movie. And I think we all pretty much enjoyed it. I don't know from the crowd that we were there with if there was anyone specifically that was like, well, that was a waste of time. It kind of weirdly landed. And it landed with the audience. Um, I will say that they have one of the smarter marketing campaigns I've seen in a while. And that they've... Uh, they made like action figures to give away at the event which contained a sem essentially an empty box where you would see something in um, and it, it, oh, the, the, they, they leaned into it in a way which I felt aided the movie like they understand the premise is ridiculous they understand it probably shouldn't work and that's why it works like rather than trying to treat this as the most serious horror movie ever made they know what it is and as a result that kind of shone through um, it's one of those ones as well that I'm very curious to go back and check out because there are so many one-liners and so much comedy and so much references I get the feeling that on a second or maybe even my third watch I'll notice more odes to other movies or more one-lines that make me remember lines from other movies um, really 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 well done like a, a surprisingly well done movie and as horror comedies go of which there weren't many actually at this year's Fright Fest previous year there was loads um, I actually felt that this stacks up against some of the best that I've ever seen the festival put on overall. Uh, yeah, like a really, 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 really good time. I hope it lands somewhere that people can check it out. It's a Saturday movie with friends, Saturday night movie with friends, beers and popcorn movie. You will have a hit with it. Um, I gave it a four, which is the, I think it's second highest score I gave out of the entire festival as a whole. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's a really, really, really good time. Do not uh, sleep on it when you get a chance to. The name is silly, the idea is silly, but the movie's silly and that's all you need to know. So The Invisible Raptor got a 4 out of 5 from this guy. And let's uh, talk about the return of RKSS, the team behind Turbo Kid and Summer of 84, who brought their brand new movie Wake Up, which is currently on the festival circuit, all the way to Fright Fest. And uh, let's find out what I made of it right after this. Wake Up is directed by... Uh, Francois Simard, Anus Wazel and Jon Carwissel who are the creative team behind RKSS, the directing duo that did Summer of 84 and Turbo Kid. This is based on a story by Alberto Marini who is behind a ton of, <laughs> a ton of Italian stuff uh, which you have probably seen before. And the movie stars uh, Thurlow Convery, Benny O. Arthur, Jacqueline Moore, Tom Gould Alicia Yoko Fontana, Kyle Schrudler, it stars Aidan O'Hare um, and some other folk are in this one as well. Um, the synopsis for Wake Up is Gen Z activists are violently picked off by a deranged night watchman after sneaking into an environmentally destructive big, furn uh, sorry, big box furniture store, kind of like Ikea but not Ikea. So wake up! Um, I was I was like all in for this one. I was like RKSS. They will always swing for the fences and very seldom miss. Wake up for me is a wildly inconsistent movie, and I get the feeling part of that is because they are not behind the script. 
of the story here. Um, and they brought a lot of their visual style, which is really cool. There is a scene in this movie which involves fluorescent paint and uh, darkness in a movie which I have, I've never seen done this way before and I thought it was like jaw-droppingly incredible how it was shot. The problem with this is that it kind of feels like kind of forced activism like it's playing into I like the, the problem is I don't understand the position the movie is taking I don't know if it's pro um you know big furniture stores and disposable commercialism is destroying the world or if it's pro anti-wokeism and woke is a term that I hate fucking using because if why doesn't exist um just a tag that people put on things when they are lazy uh, don't want to communicate with other people about complex subjects. Um, so I, I don't know what the position of the filmmaker is. And as a result, it feels very muddied. Um, the activists are thoroughly unlikable. The antagonists are thoroughly un unlikable. As a result, everyone feels like an antagonist and no one feels like a protagonist in this entire movie. I will say the guy that plays the kind of slasher killer in this one commits... To the role he is fucking terrifying um but yeah it's like an excuse for like a survival movie and a furniture store is really about as far as the movie goes i think there's kind of meta commentary on like i say activism armchair activism social media activism keyboard warriors streamers influencers there are comments on that whilst there's also comments on the you know, just get some guns and I don't think any of them are more than just the superficial level. As a result, the movie kind of flounders around looking for its own identity. It's well acted, I can't take anything away from that and the, the death scenes are well put together so I can't take anything away from that. It's well shot, can't take anything away from that but the story just feels a bit trite, it just feels a bit rehashed, feels a bit tired and for a movie that has a lot of youths running around the place, kind of feels like a bit of a slog at times. Um, RKSS are great. I love them. I'm looking forward to seeing what they do next. Summer 84 and Turbo Kid, you know, it's a one-two punch of awesomeness. Um, I know they're talking about Turbo Kid 2 and as much as I want to see that, I don't want to see that if they are motivated to do that. But yeah, overall this movie... It's stuff that you've seen done a hundred times better in other movies. Um, if you want to see a movie that kind of captures survivalism in an interesting way with British characters picking off those that are weaker, go and watch Becky. Becky like does this a hundred times better. Um, and, you know, it has a quicker pace. So, yeah. Didn't hate it. I gave it a three um, on kind of revisiting my grade and my notes for it. I stick with the three. Um... If you want to support the directors, go and check it out. If you're not necessarily that way inclined or anything I've mentioned has put you off, don't watch it. Your choice, ladies and gents. Your choice. So, uh, yeah, that was the penultimate movie on the Friday. Let's talk about the final movie, shall we? The last movie was Kill Your Lover. This is co-written by Alex Austin and Keir Stewart, who also co-directed. Um, in this one, you have Paige Gilmore, Shane Quigley-Murphy... Mae Kelly, Joshua Wincup and some other folks are in here as well. The synopsis for this one is when Dakota tries to break off her toxic relation relationship with Axel starts transforming him into a monstrous creature. He gradually succ succumbs to the poison of the decaying relationship becoming a creature with increased aggression, a touch that melts skin and worse of all he is contagious. So, Kill Your Lover was the final movie. Mercifully short, this one was under an hour and 20, and that's including credits. And if I'm honest, the closing movie of the first night of Fright Fest can always be hit or miss. I've seen more duffs on the Friday night closing than I've seen bangers. Now, the Mortuary Collection did play as the closing movie a couple of years ago on the Friday, and I was stunned by how good that was. But for the most part, they tend to be either action movies or okay, nonsense sci-fi movies or stuff along those lines. This one here, I mean, from reading the description, I was like, all right, this is kind of body horror 
and it's actual the physical manifestation of what a toxic relationship is like. This could be cool. Um, I'll be honest, I did not like this movie at all. Like, it's a relatively harsh grade for me. This movie is a five minute idea or a five minute short stretched out over an hour and 20 minutes. And that might sound like I'm being cruel, but trust me, it revisits the same things over and over again. It doesn't really progress its story beyond the fact that this relationship between two people, which seems toxic from the outset, with hindsight is toxic and their relationship will never get better because neither one of them is mature enough. And I'll be honest about it, neither character comes out this great, um, is mature enough to admit that it's doomed. Um, the performances are like someone shouting at you for an hour and 20 minutes. And that's what the story feels like as well. Like, I don't like hating for hate's sake. I thought some of the effects were pretty good and I thought the acting was okay. But it is a one note movie all the way through it. And I understand that this is a movie that's a kind of labour of love. Uh, it was kind of put together a shoestring budget. And they are kind of setting themselves out as a film directing duo as kind of getting themselves on the ladder. And I've certainly seen debut festival movies that are not as well put together as this. But there, to me, there is no depth here. It's a movie that promises depth. Um, but it just, it just felt like everyone was unlikable. And everyone was just shouting at me all the way through it. And when I realised pretty quickly into the movie there wasn't a second gear or a third gear or a fourth gear to this movie we were just kind of stuck in first all the way through it I found it quite nauseating to be honest with you uh, and draining the shortest movie of the day by a little bit and this one was the most taxing to get through that's not because I personally feel that I can imagine that that a counter argument to my opinion on this one is, well, you're a man. This is this is told from the woman's perspective, so you're never going to get it. I've been in toxic real relationships before, some of which I would argue the person would say is my fault, and on other occasions I would argue was definitely the other person's fault. But I think the nuance that is required to detail why a relationship breaks down is a little bit more than a lamp and some pictures on a wall um, and that's kind of what you're drawn back to all the way through the movie is that this couple were probably never right from the start and now we're a few years in and they've had to make changes and capitulations and accommodations to the other person's wishes it still isn't right and I think you can tell that story pretty quick um, and a nice five, ten minute short and not have it screened at the audience for an hour and 17 minutes, which was what this was. Uh, yeah, I didn't like this one. I gave it a one and a half, which seems harsh. Um, I will never watch this movie again. Um, I, I hope it does well for them. I hope they get another movie. I'd be interested. Some of the visual style, specifically around the bo body horror stuff, which like is a genre I love in horror, um, I think they nail that really, really, really well. And if I want a movie to tell me what the physical manifestation of pain and emotional distraught is, I will watch The Brood. The Brood is the jaws of that genre and everything will always be held up to that and The Brood is a lot better, a lot better than this one. So yeah, one and a half out of five for Kill Your Lover. Let's do a little recap, shall we? So Soul Eater got three and a half, The Deep Dark got three, The Invisible Raptor got four, Wake Up got two, and Kill Your Lover got one and a half. My ordering of movies on the Friday from best to worst, The Invisible Raptor was the best movie I saw, then The Soul Eater, then Wake Up, then The Deep Dark, and Kill Your Lover was at the bottom. So there we go ladies and gents, that recaps day one of Fright Fest. Glasgow 2024. Six movie reviews still to go on the second day. 
I'll be honest with you, uh, it was a mixed bag, but my favourite movie of the festival did play on the second day, so very much looking forward to chatting about that with you. As always, if you liked this video, please like and subscribe on YouTube. Um, comment below if you've seen any of these movies. Were you at Fright Fest? Have you seen any of these movies on the festival circuit? What did you make of them? Once again, it's just my opinions based on how I felt watching the movies in the theatre. It doesn't tell you not to check movies out. As always, you're the best judge of what you like. Uh, but yeah, leave some comments below. If you're checking us out on Spotify or on Anchor using the video podcast apps, for those platforms then please subscribe and answer the question that pops up at the end of the episode and lastly if you're checking us out on any of the podcatchers out there as an audio podcast then please subscribe that way you never miss any episodes from the podcast under the stairs and you also have access to the over 1300 episodes that we have in our rss feed yeah it's always great for you guys to be supporting me and uh, i look forward to giving you more content with that support so yeah, there we go. Uh, the final instalment of this two-part looking at Fright Fest will drop into your feeds later next week. So all that's left for me to say is wherever you are, what are the time zone is and what have you up to in this big bad world of ours, please take care of yourselves out there. This is Duncan McLeish broadcasting live from under the stairs and I am signing off.